we have been speaking a lot about um, this book, which European Union, but I would like to hint at that uh, Professor Fabrini has written at least two books. This is the other one called Compound Democracies, Why the United States and Europe are Becoming Similar. I think I have over here, let me see. Probably three books. Uh, okay, no, because I have the two books over there. Okay, <laughs> I would just like to hint at it's not just one book, uh, it's two books. And the other one is called Compound Democracies. I've been reading it many years ago, and I can only recommend it. It's a fantastic book where we can learn a lot for me it has been part of my own formative experience because it's about the creation of a continental union of states and citizens. So a union of continental size. And that's in fact what we try to do. When we think of the United States, we think of the United States 2016. But the United States 1776 or 1789 was something completely different. In 1776, you had 13 states which agreed to form a confederal union at the, same, at, at the time. So the starting point is not central. The starting point is decentral. It's something which was not very integrated, a lot of suspicion about, uh, about central power. And what is fascinating is to follow the constitutional development over several centuries. And what we can learn from this, at least what I've been learning from this, is that these processes are taking a lot of time. And they're not just taking time, they are progressing whenever there is a precise need. You can see, read, for example, here, uh, how the U.S. president is defined. It is defined as a very weak figure because the historical experience to be avoided were the Georgian kings. So they wanted to have a very weak president, really a minor figure. What has become out of this function after 240 years without a single treaty amendment? something completely different. That's fascinating to see. And I fear or I believe that increasingly also in the European Union, we will have to look at what is the space in the, exact, in the existing constitutional setup rather than looking for a change every, uh, every single time. Thirdly, he's describing in compound democracies in, in great detail the vertical division of power in a federal union. It's fascinating to see that, of course, in the American system, you have fixed competences for the federal level and everything else is for, for the sub-federal level. That's not our situation. In our situation, the bulk of competences is shared. And the moment we have European Union legislation, there cannot be any national legislation, which means in our, in our setup, we have enormous potential under the treaty to further integrate the union and in fact do something which has the nature of constitutional change. What is also impressive is the description of the horizontal division of power. So contrary to our national systems, both in the United States and in the European Union, we do not only have a vertical division of power between different levels of governance, we have also a horizontal division of power between, in the US system, the House, the Senate, and the administration. The legislative branch of government and the executive branch of government. It's very similar in the European Union. We have a very similar division of uh, competence horizontally between the parliament the Council, and the European Commission as the, executive, uh, as the executive branch. That changes everything. Because if you are rather in a national setup in the European Union, then you should have an identity of interest between Parliament and the executive. Which means that the parliamentary role 
is much more limited. And parliamentary freedom is much more limited, which I believe is also why it is also justified from my point of view uh, to put the other question when we have debates about democratic deficit. I think we are in a situation wherever the parliament has competence, not of democratic deficit, but of democratic surplus. Our powers towards the executive are much greater than in a national, than in a national uh, system. Uh, concerning, concerning the second, I think we have commonly identified, and I think Jim has said something uh, similar, that the real challenge is that we have to move from a situation where basically the European Union was a legislative institution and it's doing this very well, to a situation where we have to, where we have to behave as an executive entity. So how can we move from legislator and develop executive capacity? That's very visible when we are discussing now immigration, but to be honest, it was a very similar question about the euro. What executive capacities were there on central level? And both times we were confronted with a major crisis. We could also put it in other words. We are moving from a situation where European Union decisions are low impact decisions for citizens because they're basically legislative, they are perceived very often through national implementation or transposition. They're happening two or three years later. They are not even perceived as European decisions to a situation where we have high impact decisions, where it's about people's money, when it was about the euro, or people's identity, which is the question now about immigration, uh, uh, the immigration question we are having right now. That needs a completely different level of legitimacy for the system. It's not the same. It needs a completely different level of legitimacy for the system. Then the question is, what is the role of the European Council? My view is that the role the European Council has successfully played was, and it has been described as, uh, an intervention machine in crisis. Personally, I call this the elevator model of the European Council, which means in crisis, it's the only body which has the capacity to move decision-making from a dispersed set of 28 nations to the European Union level. And therefore, we should recognize this as a positive contribution to the system. The other point is that when it comes to the steady state, to administer these issues, which now have arrived to the European level, I'm not convinced that the European Council is the best organ to do that. I think when we come to steady state situations, the issue has to be moved from ad hoc council decisions, which we all know and sometimes experience are basically messy, to the much more regular organized decision-making between the institutions, which means the Commission, the Parliament, and the Council. The European Council, by its very nature, very quickly meets its limits, from the very political to the very profane. The profane we could observe last Friday when Angela Merkel had to find rescue, uh, finding French fries on Place Jordan because she felt that the feeding in the European Council was not... Belgian, Belgian fries. Belgian fries, yes. Belgian fries was not, was not completely, uh, was not completely uh, appropriate. So, we have to move it after the crisis into the steady state operation of the Parliament, the Council, and the European uh, Commission. And that's the challenge we are now confronted with. And that's raising a whole number of questions, including, including the question of central fiscal capacity. Can we move it? We had some discussions also during the Brexit weekend uh, over this. Can we move it to the European Union uh, level? And secondly, once we have moved it, who can legitimize those decisions? And the answer will not be 28 national parliaments. The answer has to be, once it has fully arrived at the European level, 
the only one who can assure democratic legitimacy and control is the European Parliament.